according to this guy and this guy. It's the 2020 Justin and Tyler Movie Awards. And let's kick things off. I'm going to kick things off this time with my number 10, which means Tyler gets the grace of the final pick of the 2020 Movie Awards. Let's kick things off with my number 10. All right, my number 10 best movie of 2020 is Onward. So animated feature features the voices of Tom Holland, Chris Pratt, and of course many others, directed by Dan Scanlon. And apparently this is a very like deeply personal yes. story for Dan Scanlon. So I also obviously have to give some respect to that. I didn't specifically look it up to find out exactly what the, the nuts and bolts of the story was, but I do remember, even when I reviewed it at the time, I remember seeing that and seeing that it was like a deeply personal narrative and deeply personal story for him. So it's the story of two uh, elf brothers, basically, in uh, kind of a, a suburban fantasy world, trying to rediscover magic so that they can reconnect with their father, who has been, uh, who has been dead for, uh, for several years. And look, this was just like, I, I fit this in the, in the lexicon of the Disney Pixar, I fit this between probably Big Hero 6 and Inside Out. I don't think it hits the emotional highs for me that Big Hero 6 does, but I enjoyed it better than I enjoyed Inside Out. And that's no disrespect to Inside Out. But I think it fits probably somewhere on the range in that area. Uh, and the animation I thought was solid, certainly solid for what it was intending to be. Thought it did have an emotional story, just didn't quite hit those emotional highs. But again, very good, very good animation, very good voice acting. Just a solidly put together a Disney Pixar, which again, yeah. th it's what they do and it's what they're going to keep doing. And it's almost like, I, I hesitate to say something like rinse, repeat, but it's like they're, they're such a consistent <laughs> uh, force in, in movies that, I mean, they're just going to keep doing it. So I always do get excited about new Disney Pixar IPs and that's exactly what this is. Maybe we'll see more from this. I'd be interested in that if it did happen. But that winds up my number 10. Problem is it got cut off at the knees because of of the pandemic. Right. It got released and then it was like a week or two later everything was like boom. Bam. Everything gets shut so down. So you can never know how well it would have done. Although it wasn't tracking to do as well mm -hmm. as other as other Pixar movies. Or quite a few other Pixar movies, but it was it might have went on to do really well. But could you never well know. Could have been it could have been one of those ones too that just like it looked like to be what it was, but then through word of mouth, it yeah. picked up a little more. It's true. You never really know. This, I think, was the last movie that I saw in theaters before everything shut down. Yeah. The only thing I'll add is that the ending for Onward actually really, really got me. And I like that they didn't give maybe the con conventional totally happy ending. Which yeah. Which kind of nice. That's but, fair. So that's all I'll add. I really like Onward, but it was an honorable mention. Yeah. Okay, so for my number 10, is Kajillionaire. Now I'm gonna read something from my notes here in a sec, but I'm just gonna say that uh, Miranda July manages to make a movie that is a little experimental, but doesn't go off the rails, does a little something interesting uh, with the format, but I'm gonna read exactly what I said. Yeah, totally. That is to say, it's a unique experience for sure. It feels a little awkward at any given point, but that reflects the mental state of Evan Rachel Wood's comparatively clumsy named Old Dolio Dine. Calling something love it or hate it is lazy criticism, so I try to avoid it, but it's hard to deny that this might fall into that category. I wouldn't go so far as to say it's challenging enough to elicit that level of vitriol or adoration, but I can see a certain audience coming over this one unimpressed and turned off by how little regard July had for playing in the more conventional sandbox. Hmm. Like, I'm not saying it's the most experimental movie I've ever seen, because it is, certainly is not. 
But I love the style, and as I said in the previous video, I am going to check out anything Miranda July does yeah. from this point on, because apparently she does this kind of stuff on the daily. Very nice. So, yeah. Number 10 is Kajillionaire. My number 9 best movie of 2020 is a movie that probably parallels uh, the current day, maybe a little more than a lot of people would want to admit. It is The Trial of the Chicago 7 which uh, has an ensemble cast, I would say probably headlined by Eddie Redmayne, uh, but I mean, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt is in this movie, Sacha Baron Cohen is in this movie. There's a lot of really great performers, top to bottom, in this movie, directed by Aaron Sorkin. So you know when it's an Aaron Sorkin movie, movie you're going to get a certain level of quality in that screenplay, and it's going to be directed a certain way. Because it's just Aaron Sorkin, like a lot of other great directors, has his signatures, has his way that he does things. So as the name would indicate, it's a dramatic retelling of the story of the Chicago 7 during the 1968 Democratic National Convention. And, uh, like, I loved, again, this, this ensemble cast is very, very good. Pretty well top to bottom, the ensemble cast is good. The writing is sharp, it's witty, it's directed very well. I loved the elements of the judges, like... Basically, it was all but a kangaroo court. Like, it was it was ridiculous the way. And, and apparently it was, you know, portrayed very real to life. I don't know. I wasn't alive in 1968. But it, it never crossed that line into being unbelievable. And there was a part, there's a, gets to a part in the movie where literally one uh, I guess he's technically the eighth member of the Chicago 7, but he was on trial at the same time, even though he wasn't really part of the Chicago 7. He happens to be, of course, the only black one. He gets taken because he continually uh, interrupts, well, interrupts the trial because he's being tried without representation. Right. So at one point, the judge orders that he be taken into another room and dealt with and basically what that meant was they took him into another room, they beat him, they gagged him, and then they brought him back out in chains. The way it winds up being portrayed in the movie is this causes his case, the case against him, to be declared a mistrial. Um, that's not the way it happened in real life. Th that event did, ha did happen, but it wasn't... It, his, his case wasn't declared a mistrial because of that. So that was... Uh, artistic license <laughs> by Aaron Sorkin, but I can totally understand why um, why he would choose to make that with dramatic effect. This is just, again, like if you watch The Social Network, you know what kind of performance strengths you're going to get out of an Aaron Sorkin movie. That's exactly what you should expect here, and that's why The Trial of the Chicago 7 was my number 9 movie of 2020. I did not see it. I did not. I did not. That, and that, was, that, was, that might be the one that you didn't see this year that maybe surprises me the most. All right, my number nine is A Cheater, Weathering With You. Ah, yes. It's not as good as Your Name, because I think the same person did Your Name. I believe which I like so, yeah. more, but this is still great. There's, there are some cheesy, like, basic anime, like, musical choices and scenes that or whatever, but that's really the only thing that bugged me, and that was only a little bit, like, it, the, the emotion is escalated so brilliantly here, and while it's not original to tie, emo uh, like, weather in with emotion, I thought it was done really effectively here, mm. and, uh, yeah, I just, I really loved weathering with you, and on a side note, from this point on, I'm not saying every movie I pick is this, but there's a bit of an Asian invasion starting here. Okay, all right. <laughs> it's in a bunch of my top... Not all of them, maybe not even half, but, like, it's still enough for me to be yeah. like, you know, there's quite a few, like, Asian-directed Asian or Asian-starring or okay. whatever. So, yeah, Asian invasion. I just want to say Asian, Asian invasion. invasion. <laughs> it's just a fun <laughs> thing to say. Yeah, I just want to say that. My number eight best movie of 2020 will be a relatively quick one. I've talked about it multiple times. It's The Gentleman. So Matthew McConaughey, Charlie Hunnam, a bit of an ensemble cast there too, which is typical in Guy Ritchie movies, directed by Guy Ritchie. Uh, story of an American drug kingpin trying to sell off his marijuana empires in England, and that basically triggers a million and one plots and double crosses and triple crosses behind his back to try to get him out of the way before he can make the sale. So the one of the signatures of Guy Ritchie movies is he tends to draw these incredible performances out of incredible casting choices. 
I think his casting is one of his absolute strengths as a filmmaker, and he puts together an excellent cast here as well that play off of each other tremendously well. Like I said, Matthew McConaughey, in general, I just really like Matthew McConaughey. Like I just, I'm just, I'm vastly interested in his movies. He put out a book. I, I really liked his performance here. I liked Charlie Hunnam's performance as well. I liked pretty well all of their performances, really. And I'm just, I'm just hooked by Guy Ritchie movies. If you're a Guy Ritchie fan, you want Guy Ritchie movies, and you like Guy Ritchie movies. And I'm a fan, and I got one, and I liked it. I liked it too. There you go. You did. You talked about it earlier. Yeah. Okay. My number eight is Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Ah. Uh. I have a slight issue with how it ended because it's just kind of like this thing happens and then it's just kind of like do 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 and then we're moving on. But right. besides that, tour de force of acting, mm. the dialogue is great. And that's really what these movies have to get, right? They have to get the acting and the dialogue because that's all there is yes. for the most part, right? Exactly. And it's, it's great like that. So I'm just going to say something because I get the feeling this is coming up again. I'm just going to say it feels a little bit like Fences, which makes sense considering they're both like based on plays, but also that they were both produced, at least in part, by Denzel Washington, who yeah. I love. So I'm just saying he's bringing these, he's bringing like these plays to the big screen. So I'm all in on this like Denzel Washington play cinematic universe. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm in, I'm in. I love, I loved Fences, which he actually starred in as well, opposite Viola Davis. But yeah, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. All, all respect to Chadwick and Viola Davis and the supporting cast and the writer and the director and Netflix for bringing it to the world and everyone. Everyone gets love. Yeah. <laughs> everyone everyone gets a star. Yeah. Look under your chair, everyone. You all get a star. <laughs> yeah, you all get a star. On um, but yeah, the ending, the ending is kind of interesting because it does just kind of like... It's just, yeah. da, 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 da. Like you what know, happened was like such a big deal. Yeah. And it was just like... Dude, okay, we're done. Yeah, kind of done. And I guess it makes a little more sense where it's a stage play. Yeah. That's a little yeah. more forgivable in a stage play. My number seven, best movie of 2020. I've talked about it a couple times. It is Just Mercy. So Michael B. Jordan and Jamie Foxx, directed by Destin Cretton. The story of uh, Brian Stevenson, who was a civil rights attorney, and his work to free, and I lost the actual person's name, Walter McMillan, who was wrongly convicted of, uh, of murder. And the one thing I will say, I did expect more grit and more of like a front-facing conflict, understanding that this is a story about race relations in Alabama. Yeah. I was kind of expecting something a little bit more than um, systemic racism exists plus like one pipe bomb. <laughs> or like a Molotov cocktail or something. It was a Molotov cocktail, I think. Like, obviously, there's tons of chemistry between Michael B. Jordan and Jamie Foxx. But Jamie Foxx also spends a good portion of the movie with Rob Morgan and O'Shea Jackson. O'Shea Jackson? As, like, they're, the three of them are inmates on death row, and they all have cells next to each other. And, like, Rob Morgan is, is slowly developing dementia. Yeah. And the chemistry that they have together and the conversations that they get to have. And, like, O'Shea Jackson is a good actor. Yeah. Yeah. And I never really gave O'Shea Jackson the credit that maybe I should. And I kind of hope to see him in more moving forward. And Des maybe Destin Cretton was able to just bring something out in him that maybe he didn't have before. So Just Mercy cracks well inside my top ten at number seven. My number seven is a cheater, but it's We Are a Little Zombie, so the Asian invasion continues. Continues. Uh, this is a, an insane movie. I would, yeah, this is the most this is the most original movie of the year. Uh, it's nuts. There's so many genres thrown in there, and they succeed, they succeed on all of them. Some of the music is more conventional movie music, but then there's like these like eight bit and like chip tune, you know, mm -hmm. music, which kind of out of place in movies. Because it's like it's video game music and like, you know, that era of video game music feels really weird in like a film. Yeah. But it works admirably. And the musical aspects of it work well. Like the song that the little kids, because they make a, like a band, like We Are Little Zombies. And they mm. have the song, We Are, We Are Little Zombies. <laughs> like it's so catchy. Yeah. Um, but then it like flirts with horror like there's a legitimately terrifying scene at one point and there's comedy it's funny it's just insane it's so kinetic 
And I, I really, I really loved it because, it, like I said, it was the most unique film of the year. Wow, fantastic. My number six best movie of 2020 is Mank. So this is uh, Gary Oldman, Amanda Seyfried, Lily Collins, and it's directed by David Fincher. So this is a dramatization of Herman Mankiewicz uh, while he was screenwriting Citizen Kane uh, alongside Orson Welles. And look, Gary Oldman has kind of carved out this niche of being in these dramatic biopics of real life people. And I hope he stays there because I think he's doing pretty darn good work with them. Even if the movies themselves aren't fantastic, he's generally almost always fantastic in them. Yeah, I loved watching him slum around. Yeah, like, just slum around as a drunk. <laughs> yeah. I, I did really, like, I considered him for best actor too in this. Because um, I really liked his performance. Yeah, and, and like basically just like making the assertion that like Herman Mankiewicz couldn't work unless he was on something, whether it was alcohol or absinthe or whatever he happened to be on at the time. He's like, I have to be on something or I can't work. Obviously, Citizen Kane is one of the most important movies of all time. So when you when you take a dramatic look at the behind the scenes creation of that with a character like Orson Welles and. Uh, you know, I, I'm assuming that most people probably didn't know too much about Herman Mankiewicz before this movie, and the kind of the, the divide between Mankiewicz and Orson Welles in the production of the movie, and again, the perform uh, performance-wise, Gary Oldman was great, Amanda Seyfried was great, Lily Collins, probably the best Lily Collins I've ever seen. David Fincher's uh, production and direction and creation I thought was really on point. I thought it was filmed really beautifully, despite the fact that it's in black and white. Really great use of shadow as a replacement. You mentioned before the way Fincher kind of uses color, and you take that away from him, but he could do kind of the same things with shadows as he would typically do with color. I thought it was just a brilliant film all the way around, so Mank is my number six. Yeah, I think my review headline was like, David Fincher, Finchers. Yeah. I know, I don't actually think it's one of his strongest films. Okay. Like, I gave it an 8 out of 10. It's not on my list. I, I did really enjoy it. Um... I, so I won't really add too much, except I do want to, like, call attention to this one scene. I can't remember where Mank himself is, but, like, there's a scene where Orson Welles storms in, and it was so menacing. Yeah. Like, I thought, that's a really good scene. I feel like he's... I think he was in, he was in bed. He was in the bed. He was in yeah. bed, and, like, Orson Welles comes in, and it's like, whew, it's just like he's this larger-than-life figure, and I thought, man... That's brilliant. Like, that's such a good scene. I don't have the name right off the top of my head of the actor who played Orson Welles, but he he had that aura of, yeah, like, I'm Orson Welles and you're everybody else. Yeah. My number six is Nomadland. Uh, write down the six because he was wrong. Uh, I gotta write down the five. It was oh, five yeah. spots off. Right, five. And, uh... I talked about Chloe as a director. I just, uh, but I mean, for those who may not have watched it, just a fantastic visual artist. Uh, but then she has, you know, Frances McDormand and a, and a great cast on top of that. So she doesn't have to worry about the acting too much because you got like a legend in there mm -hmm. holding it down. Um, so I'll just, I'll pretty much just end it there and just say, sometimes the critics get it right. Like, while it's not my favorite movie of the year, Everyone was just wanking all over it. Yeah. And I'm wanking all over it. And I, I imagine you're probably wanking all over it. Every, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I'm, I have a guess. But, <laughs> right. But, uh, yeah, it's a great movie. My number five is going to be quick. I've talked about it multiple times. It is Words on Bathroom Walls. Charlie Plummer. Yeah. Charlie Plummer, Taylor Russell. Uh, the stars and the director's name. I had to look at this because I've never heard of this person before. Thor Freudenthal. Never heard of that director's name before. But after this, I'll be seeking out more that they do. So obviously it centers on the, ad the character of Adam, who's a 17-year-old high schooler dealing with paranoid schizophrenia. And like I, I've, again, I've talked about this now in multiple videos, but when I talk about like that nuclear bomb in the last like 15 minutes... The last bit of this movie is, like, Adam wins a speechwriting contest from the school. Uh, basically, right around the time, he also gets expelled because he had a huge outburst. He stopped, stopped taking the medication for the paranoid schizophrenia, has an outburst, I think goes to prom after he's already been kicked out of school, whatever, gets put in an asylum. And uh, the, the end of the movie, he 
he's at the school at the graduation and gives this speech in front of the school where it's the first time where he actually faces up to i'm gonna start crying talking about it where he faces up to the fact that he's like you know i i have paranoid schizophrenia and this is what this is and this is what this does to me and this is what this is not who i am this is what I do sometimes and and whatever and it was such a powerful speech and for a 21 year old actor to give this and like and again looks like a 17 year old like looks like he fits the part so well and the way that this 21 year old actor delivers this incredible speech was just like oh my god like I'm bawling watching okay. this and I was not expecting to be bawling watching the end of this movie and I was like this was like treading along at a pretty good clip for me. And then at that point, I'm like, undeniably, this has to be one of the best and most evocative things I've seen all year. So that's why it winds up number five on my list. Well, now I'm unsure about what your number one will be. I guess we hold on to Nomadland for this, but I don't know what else. I Anyway. Yeah, I haven't seen it, so I got nothing to add. Mm. All right, my number five is Driveways. Ah. And I'm going to just read what I wrote because it's worded better. The friendship between Cody and Dell hit me real hard. It was so personal, so well done. You, you can say the same thing about the entire movie. Every single issue that it touches, it does so with finesse and subtlety, never needing to go into, into dramatics to tell a compelling story. From the gentle piano, the soundtracks, and to the genuine performances, from the heartfelt dialogue to the unassuming but perfectly apt way in which it's directed, this is one of the best movies of the year which I wrote months ago, and it has remained true since. Fantastic. I love Driveway. Yeah, you very clearly. <laughs> yeah. And the ending is so perfect, because they're just, like, sitting on the porch or on the stairs or whatever. Yeah. And the kid, isn't that how it, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the kid and the old man <laughs> yeah. are sitting there, and it's just so lovely. It's such a lovely little unassuming story that Absolutely. you could not have told me that I'd fall that much in love with. Because when you when you bring in something like that, you have to hit everything. Because otherwise, this is a is a complete drag. You're you're a hundred percent right. It's 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 a dangerous game to play because it's like this will end up terribly if it's not perfect. Yeah, like nothing, ha <laughs> nothing happens. <laughs> right. It's like man, man, if this isn't perfect, yeah, like this is gonna be oh boy, like this is not gonna be good, but. Luckily, it wound up being great. It was great. My number four best movie of 2020, one that you had mentioned a little bit earlier, is Soul. And clearly, I think, I guess I liked this maybe, well, I guess maybe in relative terms. So you watched well, so it, much yeah, more Yeah, that's year the than thing. It depends. Yeah, it's true. It's <laughs> a, so Soul, and obviously animated Disney Pixar, features the voices of Jamie Foxx, Tina Fey, and obviously a host of others. Uh, directed by the team... Like you, you had you had Pete mentioned Doctor this, and, and, yeah. Pete uh, Doctor and I um, I that Powers up. was the last name, right? Um, but anyway, it focuses on the character of Joe. Joe is a, a soul musician and a substitute teacher at a high school's music department. On his way to play the finally the gig of his yeah. lifetime, he's like. I think, I think it's explicitly stated that he's a character in his 40s. He's on his way to play the gig of a lifetime and dies. And while his soul is on its way to whatever the great beyond is, he gets chosen to be... Uh, actually, doesn't really get chosen. He kind of, he kind of <laughs> connives his way, basically, yeah. into being yeah. like a mentor at the great before, like you mentioned. Or the great, yeah, the great before, yeah. I guess it was. And he comes across this soul by the number of 22, one of the first souls ever created, but that has not yet found its purpose. And again, all of this is like Disney Pixar to a T. Yeah. I could have not told you that this was an animated movie, and you might have been like, was this a Disney movie? Because it sounds like, a Dis like the premise of a Disney movie. So like I mentioned before, I thought it was, in a lot of cases, such a step forward uh, animation-wise. We're talking about the lighting, the special effects, the facial expressions. Basically, in the real world, this looks like it's lightest. I wish I could have seen this on a 3D screen. Mm -hmm. I feel like in 3D, this would have popped so much and looked so incredible. As it was on my television upstairs, it was 32 inches, it looked fine. But man, on a, on a big screen and in 3D, man, that would have looked incredible. And who knows, maybe early this year I might still have that opportunity once the Oscar nominations come. 
I 100% agree with it now that I kind of have given a little bit of time for retros like retrospect. Yeah, it, that could have been designed yeah. it's probably significantly better. Like the concept of a great before is fine. I like yeah. that. It just visually, it just doesn't realize it. And I, I liked, I enjoyed the concept of like the area for like lost souls almost where it's yeah. just it's all like dark purple and it's just these giant lurching souls yeah, awesome. trying to find their their reason for being and it's and these are people that are alive like they just like completely lost their purpose in life and the and again there's all kinds of stuff as always in disney pixar movies where there's all the content it seems like it's for the kids but man as an adult sitting there you're just like there's stuff for me to think about after watching this animated yeah. movie. And and, and that's, I, I don't know that anybody does it any better, or certainly not on a more consistent basis, than Disney Pixar does. So, Soul was my number four. Yeah, you could say that the great before, the way the, the way it looks visually is meant to represent something like blandness or whatever, because it's like a factory. Yeah. Something basically, like, we gotta find you personality, right? But right. it just didn't translate well for me. Like, I don't know. But besides that, like I said, I really like the movie. That's my only real criticism. All right, my number four is Wolf Walkers. Ooh. An animated film, which honestly, if there was objectivity, this could legitimately be the best movie of the year. Because I don't know anything that it really does wrong besides, like, maybe the father's arc is a little annoying at the beginning, but then it redeems itself. But yeah, the it's just about, like, this this little girl who's a wolf walker who turns into a wolf at night when you when she sleeps like she sleeps but then she can run around as as a wolf form and the the humans are like we want to get the wolves out of the woods because you know there's a feud between them and and then the little girl befriends this wolf walker and wants to save the wolf the wolf walker and they gotta find the wolf walker's mother who's been asleep and they gotta find where she is and stuff and it turns out the humans have her and then wolf form and anyway it's really hard on the heart mm. but it's gorgeously animated screw you pixar this is the best best like animation of the year Ooh, wow. it's i don't know if you've seen a screenshot of it but if you haven't mm. look it up it's it's the animation is wonderful tremendous yeah. so wolf walkers could legitimately, like I said, could legitimately be the best movie of the year, but it's right. not my it's not my favorite. But at this point, it's so hard to number these. My number three best movie of 2020 is Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Chadwick Boseman, Viola Davis, directed by I lost the director's name, uh, George C. Wolfe, who's a name I've never really heard before. Um, so set in 1920 Chicago, it's a dramatization of a recording session from Ma uh, Rainey, who was a uh, blues singer uh, in the 20s, and Chadwick Boseman plays the trumpeteer in her background band, and it's, again, it's a recording session of some of her songs, and again, just performance pornography, and I like using that term, I think it, I think it so adequately fits movies like this, where it's just like, God, those two are just like, even when they're not on screen together, like they're just, it basically, like the movie will shift back and forth between scenes that Viola's in and scenes that Chadwick are in, and they're just, they're just doing this performance-wise, yeah. it's like, okay, you think your performance is good, yeah, I'm no, I'm gonna that. top it, and yeah, just uh, phenomenal performances, and again, like, you, you put in the context of, you know, what Chadwick Boseman was going through health-wise, which maybe you should do, maybe you shouldn't do. That's a debate for another day. But, it, like, the performance that he's able to bring out and the pain that he's able to evoke and turn on a dime in that performance, like, that's a, an actor that I will miss so terribly, obviously. I wanted to point out a particular scene, and I think this is, like, the legitimately the specific very ending scene of the movie. Okay. I didn't feel, I, I never felt dirtier at any point this year watching a movie than when the producer of, you know, Ma Rainey's songs double crosses Levy about the deal that they had made. Oh, uh, yeah. Basically, when he said, well, you know, yeah, we're just, you know, not, the song's not really for us, but I'll, or like, or, you know, not really for us, but, but I'll pay you for the songs. And I'm like, oh, don't do that. <laughs> like I even said it, I'm like, oh, don't do that. Don't sell the songs. And they, they kind of go back and forth. And every time he says it, I'm like, oh, don't do that. Don't sell the songs. And, and I 
telegraphed it. I called it. The very last scene in the movie is a group of white people recording his songs. And I'm like, oh, no, I knew that was going to happen. And I'm like, I've never, so felt, dirty, yeah. I've never felt dirtier this year watching a movie than I did watching that very last scene. And obviously it just came right off the heels of, of obviously, you know, Levy committing a terrible yeah. atrocity against somebody. And again, the, just all that pain bubbling over for him. And then you see that, and it's just like, oh, God, that's dirty. Okay, with my number three, I am going with Wonder Woman 1984. Oh, wow. Okay. This, this movie caused me a great deal of grief. All right, let's because, do it. Because, like, I wanted to review it. Right. I was a little out of it at the beginning. Don't mind me, I'm just knuckling up for the internet. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Protect me. Yeah. Um, I was... It was kind of cheesy at the beginning, right? Yeah. And I was kind of like, I was like, oh no, am I not going to enjoy this that much? I'm like, right. that's really sad, right? And then as it went on, I, I... By the end of it, I realized I really liked it, right? But I was trying to be like, well, what kind of score do I assign for it? I'm like, 75 seems too low. It's like 80 seems too low. I was like, I like it more than Soul, and I gave it an 85. And then I'm like, do I give it a 90? And I'm like, man, but that seems high, because I gave the first Wonder Woman a 90, and I like that, admittedly, I like that more. So I was like, what do I do? I don't know what to rate this. I was like, okay, I'll rate it a 90, but say that my, the 90 for this is different. I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't feel real. I'm like, okay, Wonder Woman is getting a 95, and this is getting a 90. Oh. Like, it caused me so much grief, <laughs> right? So you jacked up your rating Remember on the one, first one. one. Yes. <laughs> so I could like, so, and, and you know what? I felt I, I felt a little better about it. But you know okay. what? But you know what really allowed me to just because like I had issues with this. Mm. But you know what really allowed me to feel better about what I was doing was I thought back to you last year in the movie awards for Rise of the Skywalker, where you sat there and you said, "I just love Star Wars." Yeah. And I said to myself. And I actually built my review around this concept. I just love superhero movies. I just love superhero movies. And and also, you kind of mentioned about Broken Hearts Gallery Gallery Club, right? The, uh, Broken Hearts Gallery. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> you were like, you needed to kind of embrace what it was, what it was trying to be. And then I realized with Wonder Woman, that's what I had to do. Because it was... Like a cheesier kind of play on like old school Superman type stuff. Yes. Which is like, I like darker. And, and Wonder Woman, the first one, kind of wrote a line between the DCU darkness, but then like the MCU like light, more lighthearted yeah. stuff. Like it was kind of a mixture. And this was like more so just like, yeah, we're kind of like cheesy and. Right. We're more, closer like, more to Marvel. Upbeat, Even though there's like sad parts to it. Oh, yeah. And I realized at the end of it, it's like, even though I had issues with it, I really, really liked it. Now, mind you, this could change in time. That's what's weird about this pick, because next year I could be like, maybe I just get caught up in Wonder Woman. Right. But I just love superhero movies. And also Gal Gadot, Gal Gadot. I, I fully admit that her presence as Wonder Woman probably drove my enjoyment of that movie a lot. Maybe, of course. Maybe disproportionately so. <laughs> we, can, we can perform the gal test. Because... This year, I will make you go to the movies with me and watch Death on the Nile. Yes. Because she's in that. Yes. So if you, like, we love will. Death on the Nile... <laughs> we will see. And I watch it, and I'm like, yeah, that movie's fine. And you're like, no, this is, like, top five. <laughs> I'm going to be like, okay, there's the gal bias yeah. right there. So that that like, will be... That's the control. That's the test. Yeah. Like, I just... <laughs> I, I just love her as Wonder Woman, and yeah. I just whenever she's on screen as Wonder Woman, I'm just like she's so great. Oh, she's Girl. phenomenal! Absolutely. That, like I, I understand the criticisms of this. I agree with some of them, but at the end, I didn't, I didn't care. Right. It's freeing to not care whether you're wrong or not. Right. Yeah. It's like because now even like with the Star Wars thing, like even John Boyega now has like expressed like a lot of concerns about doing these movies and, and how they turned out and blah 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 and I'm just like cool I respect that I just kind of like Star Wars movies I don't know what else it, to yeah. say it was, it was hard to write a full blown <laughs> review on it though because like I was having a real hard time with it and I, it's why I kind of think it's my most interesting review because it's the, yeah. it's the only one where like I always acknowledge my bias in reviews but it was like this was the first time where I was like 
Criticism, criticism. Who cares though? Yeah. I just love superhero movies. Like it's probably my more interesting review because it's almost the less conventionally, the least conventional critical review that I've ever written. Because yeah. it's like, this is how it is, guys. That's fantastic. This is just how it is. This, this is interesting. Is everybody ready for me to really hardcore mess with Tyler's head? Because I certainly am. My number two best movie of 2020 is Nomadland. Dang. So I want I want your brain to churn on what this number one pick could be. I mean, I have an idea, but it seems too... Too obvious, S given what has happened. Okay. So well, I don't think it's going to be what... I think what you think it is which, like, kind of a weird sentence but look I mean we, we've talked about Nomadland at length obviously Francis McDormand directed by Chloe Zhao um, one thing I kind of wanted to point out that I don't know that I've mentioned in any of the things that we've talked about here with Nomadland the the secondary characters were almost as interesting to me as Francis McDormand was yeah, was like fun. I was really interested in Bob Wells I was really interested in uh, Spanky I was really interested in these characters that, like, are actual people and, like, actually live this life and, like, getting to know them on that level, like, almost making this feel like some kind of quasi-documentary. Right. Right, and so, like, that element of it just added a whole second layer on top of this movie for me. Because as I'm watching it, I'm like, I understand the, the, the technical... Like, I understand I'm enjoying this. Yes. I didn't expect it to wind up this high on my list at the end. But then, like, when that started developing to me more and more and more, I'm like, you know what? There's a whole other layer to this that I'm really not considering. And once I did, I was like, this is one of the elite best things I've seen all year. So that's why it, it lands at number two. And I don't know that I've missed anything else. I, I, there's a lot of interesting commentary here, I should say, on capitalism and the nomad culture and specifically how those two things actually interact with each other. Yeah. So I think there's, there's interesting commentary there that this movie touches on, but like obviously a documentary would, like you mentioned before about documentaries, would be able to go deeper on a topic yeah. like that. But there's a lot of interesting conversations that could be had there. But Nomadland is my number two. Uh, you reminded me when you were talking about the the other like the supporting cast there's a scene near the end where that one guy is talking to francis mcdonald's character it's bob wells I is think. that bob yeah, wells and he's, so. and he's see i didn't write it down so i forget but he was talking about what was his son or yeah do you remember the part i'm talking about they're just having a conversation yeah just the two of them and he's telling this story and for as emotional as some of the rest of the movie is that was the part it wasn't even like francis mcdormand's life that got me it was that guy's life that story yeah. that he said which i wish i could remember exactly what it was i was i was just like wow this is really touching yeah sad. i'm quite sure that was a conversation like the last conversation she has in the movie with bob wells i'm pretty sure we'll keep it short with number two but because because we're doing a short film huh. world of tomorrow episode three right episode three Possibly the best trilogy going, honestly. Don Hertzfeld's a, a genius. This guy is brilliant. And I've been following this since the first one, and I, I would say it's about on par with the first. It's better, than, it's better than the second. It's actually less of, like, just people monologuing, and it's actually, like, part thriller in a sense. So in a, in a way, the, the narrative pacing is getting better, but it still retains, like, the the endearing emotional beats and the humor that's part silly because ultimately it is still like a little girl talking yeah. to this like thing that she cannot possibly understand at, the, at her age so there is like that silliness of the humor but then as Hertzfeld always is it's also deceptively clever mm. and intelligent and gives you a lot to think about and if people aren't watching these it's not a, like you can probably you know, pump out all three in like an hour at this point, because I can't remember how long they all are, but they're short films, so an hour of your life, and it's some of the most substantial, entertaining, intelligent stuff you'll see. Yeah. 
So, yeah. World of Tomorrow Episode 3, that's not actually the full name, but I didn't write down the full name. It doesn't <laughs> matter. It's, it's Episode 3. No, you've, you've, you've recommended them to me multiple times, and at this point I really don't have any excuse for not taking an hour out of my life. Yeah. To, <laughs> to great. And to I think, go ahead and I think watch there's going to be another one as well, I believe. So, it's, it, it, that's going to that's gonna be on the list. It's going gonna, it's gonna <laughs> to be up there pretty high. Yeah. We've reached the end, folks. It's our number one best movies of 2020, and I will cause the suspense to occur no longer. This movie stars Sean Bean and Honor Neefsey, directed by the duo of Moore and Stewart. My number one best movie of 2020 is Wolf Walkers. Oh shit, you did watch Wolf Walkers. <laughs> I did watch Wolf Walkers. Good. And I had to fight the whole time you're talking about Wolf Walkers not to sell it that I watched <laughs> Wolf Walkers. Isn't it beautiful? It is so good. Because I remember like I, I had my eye on it for a couple months and actually tried to get a screener which never yes. they told me they were gonna give me one, but they never did. <laughs> but then like I remember I was like just about to watch it when it got its more full release and I was like I don't know if this is any good yet because I just started it but you should keep your eye and try to watch Wolf Walker and you were like I don't know if I will yeah and I was like fuck you <laughs> <laughs> go on no, so shower it with <laughs> gifts so like Tyler said it, it's set in uh, occupied Ireland so this was Ireland at the time that it was occupied by Britain yeah uh, so it's set in occupied Ireland, the town of Kilkenny, who deals with this pack of wolves who is in this in this forest, and you have like the grand the great protector, yeah. who's basically saying like we need the wood and resources that are in that forest, go get that forest, and basically the pack of wolves are preventing that because that's their home, and it's the story of like I say the one uh, the one girl I yeah, got, I had her name I right had her now, name too. I... Uh, but now it's, it's kind it's, of a weird It's name, lost, yeah. but uh, no, it's Robin, Robin Goodfellow. So she, yeah, she befriends this little girl that she meets out in the woods while she's trying to go out and help her father. And it's a wolf walker. It's someone who has communed with the wolves. And like Tyler said, when they sleep, basically their spirit can leave their body in the form of a wolf. And this, for as much as I gushed in these awards about Disney Pixar, Oh my god, this movie is so beautiful. Right. It is animated in right. such a way. It's just, it almost looks like it was like animated in like the 90s. I think it has more character than like a Pixar. Like I love yeah. Pixar animation, but I just feel like this is even so much more character. It has so much personality. Yeah. Just the way the movie, just the way it's animated puts so much personality in it. And look, this aesthetic, this Irish aesthetic, like 17th century Ireland, I'm like, okay, I'm... I'm I'm down for this. I'm comfortable with this. It's Celtic. And you mentioned the father's arc. And that was a, a criticism that I saw multiple people bring Just up. Just for a bit. It was a yeah. bit annoying at first. For me, like, I kind of took it, and it was, it was grating at first. I, I used it and looked at it in a particular way. Like, I think it's, it's understood that the mind of children are f far more likely to accept the yeah. fantastical. And, like, yes. adulthood kind of beats that out of you, for lack of a better term. So, now, the father's arc was great because he held on to that for so long yeah, in the face of a ton of evidence. That yeah. This yeah, see, that's the thing. That's what was kind of annoying. And, and, like, he didn't really have this gradual, like, realization that, like, oh, my God, Robin was right all along. He has this very much, like, no, it's not true, it's not true, it's not true, it's not true. I'm a wolf walker now. So it's like there, there, so like that arc was kind of like, eh, okay, that could have been done better. Other than that, yes, there's nothing else to criticize it for. This stands as one of the greatest animated movies I have ever seen. Agreed. This this will be in front of the eyes of my children someday. And apparently, this was like the third movie in a trilogy. Look that up on the Wikipedia page, Google it, yeah. find it, watch those movies, and for the love of God, please watch Wolf Walkers, my number one best movie of 2020. So here's like a little insider secret. So so my number, like, right, so I had number four was originally Wonder Woman, and then mm -hmm. I called the Audible and switched Wonder Woman with Wolf Walkers. So Wolf Walkers was my number three, you know, and World of Tomorrow my number two. Mm -hmm. 
But the thing is, I had rated Wolfwalkers originally a 95, which would place it in the same spot as my number two and my number one. Yeah. And I got lost in like the Wonder Woman there, but now that now that like you're talking to me about Wolfwalkers, now I'm like I made the wrong mistake. It should have been number two. <laughs> like, cause like I love it. I I adore this. Like, okay, so I can't remember. You you might be able to, but the the studio that does Kubo. Yes. Which I also think is one of the greatest animated. Which I think you agree with me on. Actually, we agree on animated movies. Cause we both we really do. Wally too, don't we? And Coco. Yeah, yeah, like but we, you're a little higher on Coco as much as okay. I love it, but no, I love Coco too, but like it's mm-hmm. I agree with you, this is one of the greatest animated movies ever made. But the reason it doesn't it couldn't it couldn't be the best movie of the year. I think I know which one. Is because the number one movie of the year is the movie that I would have made if I had talent. Okay. Get duked. <laughs> <laughs> because Everything about this is me. Right. <laughs> Rabbit nailed it. Rabbit poo nailed it. Great shots of beautiful environments and landscapes, like wide angle. Got it. A silly sense, like silly sense of humor. Got it. Um, excellent use of rap because I seem to be really partial to really good like rap used in movies. It like really gets me. Hmm. I think that Ninian Doff is me. <laughs> so Ninian, if you're out there, hit him up on Twitter. Yeah. No, he has. Oh, there you go. I because when I po- <laughs> when I posted my best movies of the year, like halfway through the year, like it was my one of my first articles I ever wrote when I launched the site, and then before I know it, he must have found the tweet, and he was like, "You've got excellent taste in movies," and I was like, "Oh shit, that's the director," <laughs> and then. I don't know if he followed me. He might even still follow me. And I was like, yeah, your movie's awesome. Like, and yeah, so he already did hit me up on Twitter. There you go. Like, because we are the same person. But you said, man, that would be mind-blowing if you picked Get Duped. I'm like, yeah, well, there you go. Mind blown. Because I figured that the amount of rabbitry in it would have given it away. I mean, I guess. But, (laughs) no, wow. There you go, folks. We got a couple of real bangers like, at the real end. bangers at the end there. So, Wolfwalkers and Get Duked, aka Boys in the Wood, is your number one best movie or best movies, I should say, of 2020. That brings to a close this three-part look at our top 30 best movies of 2020, and we shall have closing statements momentarily. We've come to the end of our fellowship for yet another year, ladies and gentlemen. The 2020 Justin and Tyler Movie Awards are now officially drawing to a close. You've learned everything that we loved and some of the stuff we hated from the year of 2020 in film. On behalf of Tyler, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time to watch yet another year of Movie Awards. We love doing this every single year and bringing the movie opinions to you, our viewers, however many of you there are. We will see you again in 2021, like it is apparently right now. 2021 Movie Awards, we'll see you again, but thank you so much for watching. And the 2020 Justin and Tyler Movie Awards are officially closed.